Hey, hello and welcome back to the studio. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you today to talk a bit about personalization. So this is obviously a hot topic uh, in the industry and it's something where uh, significant progress hasn't just already been made, but is continually being made uh, with advances in terms of data gathering, AI support, improved algorithms, better integration, it's basically all go on the personalization front. Uh, so today, it's a great pleasure to have with me uh, in the studio uh, a very special guest, Simon Reichel from uh, Find Logic. And we're joined by Simon, who will introduce himself in a second, uh, as well as by uh, a couple of virtual guests who are reprising uh, some interviews they gave with us uh, very recently about the work they're doing at Bowdoin and Oliver Bonas on personalization. So lots of things to pick up on here. Uh, so the first thing to say is you can put your pens down, have a rest, because as ever, uh, a copy of the deck and the recording will be made uh, available to you in the following uh, follow-up email. So that's the first bit. The second thing is now isn't a time to be shy. Uh, drop us any questions. Uh, we'll try and cover as many as we can during the uh, broadcast. Um, but if we don't, uh, we'll look at all the questions and try and answer those in the follow-up uh, as well. So I think those are the only uh, rules we have. Uh, all very simple. We all know how this works by now. So let's uh, jump straight over and say a proper hello uh, to Simon. Simon, welcome. Uh, where are you joining us from today? Today from Salzburg. Ian, hello, very well, welcome. Simon, a warm welcome to you as well. And um, we're all, of course, uh, watching uh, Angela's every word to see whether she's going to allow uh, post-Brexit Brits to travel to wonderful Germany. So our fingers are crossed. Uh, we'll be able to meet in person soon. Now, Simon, tell us a bit about, uh, about you and about Find Logic before we go any further. Of course. Thank you very much. Yes, um, to myself, um, joining the e-commerce circus and Logic since around eight years now. Um, yes, and the possibility since then to join one of the leading companies for search navigation and uh, personalization in the e-com sector. Now, uh, you said search navigation and personalization. So back in the first decade of this century, um, a lot of the development of e-com was around searchandising, search navigation, structured catalogs, allocating products to the right place. But you now say search navigation and personalization. So tell me how these two have come together uh, for the customer experience. Very good question. So in the end, um, what we see more than ever, you're referring to the first decade of the century, I would agree here, but since, yeah, the very beginning of this pandemic, we're uh, still in, correct? The basics of search and navigation is one of the biggest lever still out there to gather, yeah, first party data. And yeah, um, in this case, still a very important topic, but of course, in the portfolio, um, personalization, so on-site experience in a global customer journey is in the same mix. So personalization, as we will see later on with those amazing two stories and merchants out there you have in the mix, um, it's part of this journey of this on-site experience people are expecting those days. Yes, and more than expecting, um, you know, we should uh, just be frank about the extent of usage. So um, I asked the team uh, to look over the top 500 retailers in the UK, uh, listed of course in our top 500 ranking, uh, but also the Growth 2000, who very crudely speaking are 501 to 2500, and across Europe at the Growth 3000. So what we found is that 86% of the top 500 are using a form of personalization. Now, there are many systems, some systems with a bit of personalization, some things are totally personalization. 
you know, it's, it's a relatively broad field, but the main thing is 86% of the best and the biggest retailers are using it. Um, I was intrigued to see now that half of what we'd have called the SME or the newer businesses are also adopting uh, personalization as well. So Simon, does this um, shock you that there are so many or does it shock you that there are still half that aren't using personalization? Is this 50% a good thing or a bad thing for growing companies? Hopefully a good thing. Yeah, I'm in the tech sector, so <laughs> I couldn't give a different answer. No, in the end, I would have expected more already, to be honest. Um, you know, everyone in the industry, I think, is following the latest trends on LinkedIn or wherever. So I, was ex I would have expected more, but I think we're still in this transition. You know, everybody's switching to platforms, um, new systems coming up more frequently than ever. So to be honest, it doesn't shock me at all. So I think what will be interesting now is to see uh, the rate of change. So this is a bit of a snapshot for us. Uh, and I would agree with you that with platforms, software as a service, better integration, um, the, the gap between, oh, I think I need it and, oh, I've just got it, is coming down to weeks rather than years. So I think that's very positive. Well, uh, shall we have uh, a listen to... Um, some comments of some retailers. So we were uh, lucky to get some of Nicola Hewitt's time uh, very recently. And um, in a broader conversation, we were asking, um, we were asking her about how personalization fits into the offer uh, that Bowden is making. Now, we caught Nicola after she'd um, recently joined the business and they are continuing their move from being a catalog business with a shop to being a multi-channel business with a very strong and loyal connection to their customers. And um, what was interesting was how she looks at the many options within personalization and getting an interesting view on micro segmentation. So one of the big challenges we have obviously is um, how much effort, how granular should we be in personalization. Uh, and there's something I know, Simon, that we've talked about as well, which is the balance between the human and the AI, um, and then her focus on the customer journey. So um, that's the prelude. We've got a few minutes now of uh, Nicola. So let's just hear uh, from her how they are approaching personalization. So yeah, so Bowdoin is a clothing retailer. We sell women's, men's and children's clothing. Our core markets are UK, Germany and France, uh, UK, Germany and the USA. And we are well known for our colourful clothing, our prints and in particular women like our dresses. So my role, I'm digital director at Bowdoin. I did indeed start two weeks before lockdown. So a lot of the people that I work with, I have only ever met over Zoom. My role is really to deliver the digital experience for our customer. So through our marketing touch points, through our website, and really the creation of the role was to make sure that we combined the more commercial element of driving sales through our site with our brand experience and also with the technology, with product development of our website. Yeah, so when you look at personalization is how can we be more relevant and more helpful to our customer? So we know that our customer is typically a time poor person, either because she's working and got a family or juggling both. And so we want to make sure that when we do communicate with her, when we do come into contact with her, we're making the experience really relevant, engaging, immersive, but also easy so that she eventually converts and so that we can make her a loyal customer. In terms of what we've been doing, you can do a certain amount of personalization on catalogs in that we understand our different segments and can send different catalogs according to, are you a children's wear customer or a women's wear customer, that sort of thing. But really, I think personalization comes into its own in the digital arena where you can be much more targeted. We are not doing much one-to-one -one personalization apart from in the channels you might expect, such as email and some elements on site, such as recently browsed. And in email, we are quite extensive, as you would expect, the traditional abandoned basket, abandoned browse, 
but we also do things like your birthday, your anniversary of shopping with us, we'll send you an email. So we'll do some one-to-one -one there, but essentially we're trying to take a segment approach to personalization. Mm -hmm. And we are, this year, we've just launched a pilot where we have taken a couple of segments that are what we call a product affinity segments. And we are trying to launch a campaign across our marketing channels. Um, and so at any touch point that a customer is in touch with us, they will get a consistent experience. And that goes through various paid channels, email, and onto our site experience. Um, early days to see whether we uh, have success, but it is quite an all-encompassing program that will ultimately drive our customer data strategy and our marketing technology stack so that we can deliver this at scale. It can get quite immense if you're trying to do micro segmentation. So where it's easy, we will do some tests on, as you mentioned, children's wear customers that we know come onto our site, we might serve them up with a children's wear homepage rather than our typical homepage that is quite women's focused. There are, there are some things like that you can do pretty easily. What we're trying to test is slightly more complex models for our segmentation. So I mentioned the product affinity model where we're looking to see within our database of customers, really what have they bought and is there a pattern of what they bought what they bought that is sort of different to the norm. And so if we can recognize that, so for example, if we know that a customer typically buys casual wear from us and holiday wear, but our main campaigns are going to be all about cashmere, but they've never interested in, never shown any interest in cashmere, then our campaign will be focusing more on the casual and the holiday wear rather than our standard sort of cashmere message that might be going out for that month. So that makes it more complicated. I think we, especially the stage we're at, we can choose a couple of segments and test them because of the complexity of kind of orchestrating that journey across channels. And of course, the age old complexity of getting your creative and getting that through, to, through on your campaigns to those customers. So various algorithms run on our site in various areas of our site and we test those against a more manual version. So elements of our site, for example, new in, we do on a manual basis and we make it very visual and we decide other areas will be AI. And I think, you know, that's the way to go just to test and learn. It would be great in some ways if machines could do a lot of this, because if you want to get to that micro segmentation level, it's going to be pretty difficult to have armies of people uh, trying to deliver that. So, but I think it is a balance. We're quite specific about the measure of success we're using, for example, for this pilot program, which is a sort of sales customer um, uplift that we would expect to see, but we also measure things like engagement, conversion, page visits, that sort of thing. Um, we would also then, if, if we are getting a sort of commercial uplift on our activity, we also then need to understand, right, well, how much effort went into delivering that and how can we get efficient by using technology? So we tend to look at it from that point of view and then we will, we will probably take an incremental approach and say, right, what can we add on to what we've got that's going to help us and make our lives easier so that we can deliver something better for our customer. So what we've tried to do is take a customer journey approach. And I think many businesses take a channel approach and they don't necessarily, a lot of people talk about, oh yeah, yeah, we like to know where our customer first gets in contact with us or first sees us right the way through to purchase and post-purchase. But in the reality, the way businesses are set, that doesn't happen. So what we're trying to do is really take that customer journey perspective, which means working across teams. And especially when you've got something like personalization, which probably involves your IT team, your data team, wherever it sits, your creative teams, your market, anyway, lots and lots of teams. So I think in order to deliver this successfully, it has got to be a cross-functional thing. So that's challenging, but it also is quite exciting because a lot of people say, for example, you just spent your entire time working on email and suddenly you have to engage with all these other people. It actually opens up a whole new world and it's quite exciting. Great. Well, look, uh, some really 
insightful uh, comments there from uh, Nicola and uh, you know she was very open with us. Uh, was there anything um, in particular that uh, resonated with you there Simon? In particular I love the whole story. Um, two or three things I want to stress out. Um, I loved what she said about um, getting the customer and the journeys very very tied it up to the um, add to cart to the purchase, correct? This is what we all feel. Ian, you feel it, I feel it. If I want to hear a song from 2010, it's two clicks in Spotify. If I feel like I want to watch the Truman Show, it's two clicks on Netflix. It's the same in those web stores out there. So everything she explained around, make it as easy as possible to come to your cart, get the desired product. That's what's really um yeah we have 2021 that's how we would expect that world and in the end um the complete focus on the customer journey and not yeah respective channels this is is the focus you need to have to to be successful and outstand your competition those days and one point you made uh was about micro segmentation and we we'll hear this come up again uh, when we hear from Camilla uh, in a few minutes. Um, what, what's your approach? So if someone's t talking with you and saying, we want to implement this, um, how do you go about finding with them the right amount of personalization to start off with? So somewhere between we send the same thing to everybody, right down to there's a unique experience for Simon or for Ian. Where in between, how do you decide how far to take the level of personalization right at the outset? We, um, as a software company, ask ourselves that question very often because, as you're aware, at a certain point, you have to limit yourself and your portfolio, correct? So we decided at our end to limit ourselves very clearly and follow the best of breed technology paradigm, correct? So in the end, what we offer within personalization is limited to a certain amount. Micro-segmentation, for example, would be something we have special partners for. Native APIs that feed us again with this information to enhance search and navigation that should profit from that information. But from a company perspective, we clearly decided at a point that this is something we're having a clear partner with because it's a whole new topic, correct? So that's very interesting then. So it's as if there's the broad, so somewhere we've got the product which suggests itself a level of categorization. Then we've got the customers which suggest in some ways some broad segmentation. And then there are specialisms which dive deeper into that uh, if we want to go there. Uh, well, look, why don't we hear a bit more about um, someone you've been working with um, which is uh, a company called Pour Moi, uh, based in Brighton, uh, a company that is, uh, you know, growing and uh, focuses very much on being relevant to um, consumers. So personalization, relevance, very important here. Uh, Simon, tell us a bit about the company and the journey that they've been on with you. With pleasure, Ian. So in the end, yes, we are enlightened to help Pour Moi um, since, what is it, half a year now, I guess, within their exponential growth. So we have a pure player here, so no multi-channel or omni-channel, no line strategy, what you call it those days, correct? So um, we were confronted with a lot of yeah stuff following one main idea of Gareth. Gareth Jones, also a very warm hello on this uh, from my end here. He said, Simon, if you offer within your product something that we can outstand competition while setting trends ourselves instead of coping them, we have, uh, you have my attention. And he clearly said something like reduce the total clicks to get the user from point A to point B. He said, but as well, I want the user to engage and get a lot of contextual information while interacting with poor moi, deliver this more. Seems, this is impossible. This is like um, yeah. being asked to be black and white at the same time. I want to be inspired 
and covered in content, but one click from product to purchase. So how, how do you square that uh, seemingly impossible uh, set of demands? With um, actually our addition to our traditional portfolio, um, our lately registered technology, Lisa, so short version for our shop, the shopping assistant, our linguistic one, um, we managed most of all for their mobile experience to give total new experience and combine those worlds. Thank you very much. This slide shows it pretty good. Use your mobile phone, Ian, also afterwards. Get your smartphone, get the most interesting suggested um, search queries and experience something you also experience from Instagram, from TikTok, from Facebook out there. Their target group is very young. So in the end, we needed to optimize the user interface and the user experience also in the front end with our technology. And as we see um, the statistics and the KPI speaks for themselves, it was an amazing uplift through almost every KPI we were driving. Um, so just amazing. Now, this is interesting because it does look very much like um, a social media interface. So um, to what extent do you think uh, it is just about a design question? So if I made my website look a bit more Instagrammy, it would just be better received? Or are there other things happening in the mobile interface that uh, need to be part of the solution? I would have some questions for you um, directly back because it depends, correct? That's the question, no one, uh, the answer no one wants to hear, but it depends because you have to clearly see who's your ideal customer. Check that profile. Where are you approaching your customers? How do they find you? Um, yeah, all those questions, which, which vertical, what are you selling? Um, a lot of stuff you need to consider. So I think it's not the golden path to make everything look like some social media platform. But in this case, um, it was the right way to do it, have a seamless experience. Good. Uh, tell me a bit more about Lisa then, because um, I can't let an acronym go by without asking. So I now realize it's Li S R Lisa. So uh, what does that stand for and what does Lisa do? So um, in the end, it stands exactly for Linguistic Shopping Assistant. Nice. Yeah, we needed to um, because the other one was already registered. So um, <laughs> it fit it anyway. The shopping assistant was the most important part, correct? We agree on that. Yes, yes. Um, so in the end, what we do, um, we go beyond traditional search to sum it up. We're supercharging um, the results. And how do we do that? In the end, we cluster different intents. We look at the top 100 queries at online shops. And we did that in large scale through all our customers, our, our queries up to, what was it, 50, 60 million. And we double checked them. Long tail is not a thing at the moment with most of our shops. It's around very generic terms like categories, brands, most of them. We will see how this develops because um, we are aware that voice is coming. And if you speak to your device, you have the long tail again. But until then, we see that if you cluster those very generic terms into, let's say, around four to six different intents, because if you're looking for a brand, you have a different intent than if you're looking for a very upper category, correct? And we answer differently. So if you look at those beautiful mobile um, visualizations you have on that screen, we answer differently. You see three different skills beyond that bubble. So this is the visualization of Lisa, correct? That bubble that talks to you, shopping assistant, a virtual one, like in the physical store, and we react in a different skill. So whatever the query is, whatever the intent is, we answer in a different way. Interesting. And again, um, what I'm picking up here is that when you get started with this, it is that four to six, the magic half dozen that you get going with get the revenue increase, uh, and then obviously you can improve in time if there's a value. 
Uh, this is actually something that uh, Camilla picks up um, when we um, chat with her. So we spoke with um, Oliver Bonus, uh, which again, it's, it's one of those brands that you somehow think is uh, just a little local brand on your high street, quite quirky, strong personality. Uh, and then you realise it's been running for 26 years. They've got, you know, uh, way more stores than you thought. Um, but what's interesting about uh, Camilla's approach is they're saying that because they have a limited product line, they have more customers than they have products. And so there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. They start running out of products. So it's interesting to hear uh, how she talks about it. And again, uh, I think Simon echoes uh, one of the things you were talking about, which is the importance of finding things, um, as well as starting step by step. So, again, having set that up, let's hear directly uh, from Camilla Tress uh, about what they're doing uh, in their approach to personalization uh, on Oliver Bonus. Oliver Bonus, uh, for people who don't know, is an independent lifestyle retailer based across the UK. We have around 80 stores, give or take, at the moment because of uh, the pandemic, opening soon. We also have a, a quite a strong online presence. And we have been going along around for about 26 years, actually. People think we're new, but, we're, but we've been around for a very long time. I am more recently a connected commerce lead, which is about trying to create a seamless experience for customers across bricks and mortar and online and try and use the new terminology of a unified experience. Well, as a business, the customer has always been really important to us right from the start 26 years ago. And so the whole customer service and the, the, the staff store have always put the customer as a priority. So early on in our online, certainly on our online um, development, we introduced personalization on our site. So I'd say we were pretty early adopters. Back in 2015, we decided to build it ourselves. So we took a machine learning tool called Prediction.io and we built it on site for personalized recommendations, personalized uh, product listing pages, and developed it from there. You know, it's taken a little while to develop it properly, and we never got to the one-to-one -one personalization. We used a sort of aggregated uh, customer personalization, and that's actually been quite successful, but it's got to the end of its road. So another area where we um, thought personalization was important was on-site search, so that when you search for something, that the mo most relevant products appear for you. So we, we set up with a AI-based on-search company. And as, again, it was sort of an aggregated personalization for search results. And we decided to test one-to-one -one personalization versus the, the um, overall general personalization. And there was almost nothing in it. And so I would say to people, don't, don't rush out and think you have to do one-to-one -one personalization. It's going to be the silver bullet for your business. And the reason why was because, for instance, with search, if you search for a red dress on our website, well, we've only got probably one or two red dresses. So whether it's one-to-one -one personalized or general, you're going to get the same results. So it's just something to think, in you know, not to get caught up sometimes in, in, mm -hmm. in the hype around a lot of these things to really understand what is going to work for your business and where is what I we definitely are trying to improve our personalization through our email communications and online as i say our prediction io experience has sort of come slightly to the end of the road so we're looking to our next steps we are also um what one of the most important things for personalization certainly in the online world is is to have a singular single customer view you know the 360 view of your customer so we have invested in a cdxp but it also helps you with uh, marketing automation and really really building up the data around your customer so that you can provide a really good personalized experience for them. And, you know, there, there, there's also this all constant sort of opposition that retailers or not just retailers, any business has to deal with, which is customers say they want a personalized experience and all the data says, oh, yes, 81% of customers say they want a personalized experience and so they can have an emotional connection with you. And then the next thing you read is 75% of customers are wary about giving you their data. So it's, it's a constant challenge between providing the personalized experience they want without, you know, being creepy or taking too much data or, 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 or just not being compliant. Mm -hmm. So it's about really building trust with your consumers at the same time as providing that personalized experience is really important. 
It does sound like you need to engage your team more broadly. Can you tell us a bit about how, you know, your path on personalization has changed the way people work together to both deliver and exploit the capabilities? Well, I think you have to, don't you? Because personalization covers sort of every aspect of of the business and it's hard to escape it now. So whether it's you're personalizing what emails you receive, whether you're personalizing the experience as people land on your website, whether you're personalizing your retargeting, personalization impacts every part of the business and the journey. So you have to break down these silos. And we find that we have now working much more closely across our marketing, our SEO, and our customer services team. And in general, you realize that, well, you don't realize you have no choice but but to break down these silos. It's not always easy. And that's where a lot of, that's where something like a CDP does come in handy because it helps bring the data together. I think it's about, I think what I said earlier is, is don't feel you have to jump right in because it's if you get personalization wrong, you're also in danger of you know creating a sort of a bad experience. So mm. so just learn as you go and take it step by step is what I'd say. You know, I just think it is a complex area, it is hard to get right, and better to start slowly with the data that you have than try and you know jump through hoops to 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 be a uh, top dog, if you like. Right. <laughs> Wow. So, uh, so much in that uh, brief clip. Um, I mean, the bit that uh, resonates with me, of course, is the notion of building trust and, you know, making sure that customers, especially now with all of the emphasis on first party um, data and really, uh, you know, having that direct relationship with the customer, uh, that really st- stuck out for me as well as of course the pioneering history of starting it themselves uh, a DIY approach with some AI. Uh, Simon what what in particular resonated uh, in Camilla's uh, section there? Two things Um, Ian. So first of all of course uh, following a search navigation company in the core I tried on Oliver Bonas to search for the red dress um, in the end, it leads me to a no result page. So Camilla, some homework to do, but I think our colleagues from Bloomridge, <laughs> they can manage that. Uh, should be easy. And the second one, so also here, if I'm, so what should happen afterwards, correct? I explained I have a, a massive chance, for example, here at Oliver Bonus to get understanding when a customer speaks to me as a digital platform. So the search bar is the perfect, um, uh, the perfect thing um, to use to understand your customers properly. So, this was the first thing. The, the second one was she was um, mentioning one very important topic around not getting too intrusive. Um, I loved one web shop in Munich uh, where I bought my sneakers from. They implemented something like a one-to-one personalization, and the whole category switched because something triggered from my end, correct? They detected mm-hmm. something was interested in some Nikes, in some Nike Airs. And then if I uh, went to categories, they switched during my experience and I didn't feel comfortable. So I think this is something she um, had a very clear point on. Mm-hmm. I can confirm. Great. Well, look, uh, so much there that we've covered off. Um, but is there anything that you're thinking we can't leave without mentioning something. So you've covered mobile trust, taking it step by step, not being spooky. Uh, we've looked at the balance between uh, micro segmentation and just a sensible starting point. Uh, Simon, have I forgotten anything? No, um, perhaps at the end we can encourage the audience, Ian. So uh, what we try to do as a company since 13 years in software business, and I think that's also something where merchants find themselves, the competition is bigger than ever, correct? There is no real USP anymore uh, besides price and nobody wants to be, yeah, the cheap one where customers come from. We, We need loyalty. We need customers that love your brand. So what I can encourage you and what we do since years is being disruptive while focusing on the core product, on the core business, whatever it is out there. 
So try something new besides the business that is already running. Otherwise, you will not make the long way. Well, uh, sage words there. So um, look, Simon, thank you so much for joining me, uh, sharing your example and uh, discussing uh, Bowden and Oliver Bonus. Um, it definitely is such a busy time. I think there is this combination of uh, you know, wanting to be the best for the customer, but also I think the reality that's now saying that in a world with um, voice control, uh, voice shopping, a mobile in everyone's hand, there's no opting out. So if we're not uh, at least being as good as everyone else, we're not in the game. So I think there's uh, going to be much, much more to come on personalization. And hopefully uh, in our autumn series, uh, we can come back and see what progress uh, has been made um, over the summer, because uh, literally every week brings changes now. So um, listen, our time is up. Simon, thank you very much for uh, joining me from Germany. Uh, thank you, everyone else, uh, who's given us some of your time today. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are. Um, again, any questions you have or suggestions for future coverage, uh, do let us know. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear that. And of course, we are um, covering as much as we can in the current e-commerce world review so do make sure you sign up for um, the other sessions as well uh, we've got 15 um, sessions in total this week and uh, we will be back though fear not in the autumn with the next e-commerce world review uh, but for now it's a big thank you from me and also uh, Simon and happy trading to everyone thank you very much enjoy your day